All right. A third COVID-19 vaccine could be approved as soon as the end of the week for use in the U.S., offering a potentially significant boost in access and immunization in this fight over this pandemic. The FDA is reviewing the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and the company hopes that once it gets the green light, it can start distributing millions of doses nationwide. Unlike the Moderna and Pfizer versions, people only need one shot of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So it could be a bit of a game changer. I want to bring in uh, Josh, Josh Michaud to discuss the vaccines and the state of the fight against the pandemic here in the U.S. He is the Associate Director for Global Health Policy at the nonprofit Kaiser Family Foundation. Thanks for joining us. And, you know, it's nice to get um, a little bit of good news considering we're marking such a um, tragic and sad, um, uh, 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 I guess, a... Uh, the number of deaths, I should say, to reaching to the point, getting to the point where we're looking at half a million deaths is tragic and sad. And mm -hmm. to know that at least there is some good news um, is heartening. So, Joshua, there are several differences between the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and the other vaccines. Can you sort of spell them out for us? Sure. Well, it, it's always great news to have access to a new vaccine, and we'll see what the FDA says. But all expectations are that we will see another authorization for this vaccine. Um, and the way that it's uh, different from the vaccines that have already been authorized, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, are, are several. So one, it's a different type of technology. So as we know, the other vaccines um, already authorized are uh, mRNA vaccines, this technology uh, called mRNA. Uh, the Pfizer, excuse me, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uses a different type of technology, which has shown to be effective. Um, and uh, the fact that it's a single shot and that it can be stored at regular refrigerator temperatures makes it a much more easier to handle vaccine than uh, both the Pfizer and Moderna. As we know, those vaccines require uh, some fairly strict uh, cold chain requirements and uh, freezing. Um, so the, the other thing to know is that uh, the studies of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine have shown that it is highly effective at uh, reducing hospitalizations and deaths. In fact, none of the people who were vaccinated in the trials with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine had uh, uh, hospitalizations or deaths, which is the same as the uh, Pfizer Moderna vaccines. Now, when you start to compare the efficacy of the vaccine uh, in reducing uh, moderate to severe infections, uh, you know, the, the efficacy was shown to be a little bit lower than uh, what we saw with the Pfizer Moderna vaccines. And so there's going to be some discussion, uh, both at the FDA and at the CDC and, and outside of those agencies exactly how is the best way to utilize this vaccine, given that it has a lot of pros uh, and also has some differences with the vaccines that we already have on hand. So here's sort of my concern. You know, with all the vaccines, there's kind of been evolving information. Um, with the first two vaccines, first it was, you know, you had to take them, whether, whether it's four weeks apart or six weeks apart. And then we heard, oh, maybe, you know, you can, you can stretch that time. Or maybe you can, you know, in a pinch, you could get a Moderna vaccine for your first shot, and then you could get the other shot. Uh, you know, the other Pfizer version for your second shot. I think when people hear information changing, it makes them really nervous. So the Johnson & Johnson vaccine sounds great. One shot. It doesn't need the, you know, the special freezing sort of technology. You, it, it's great. But then I think people start to wonder, well, could it be as good as the other ones? Why, you know, why didn't we have the Johnson & Johnson vaccine first then? How do you tackle um the hesitancy, vaccine hesitancy, when people are just increasingly more confused about the information surrounding vaccines? Yeah, it's a real challenge for sure. And and we're, I, I think public health authorities are gonna have to um, think carefully about how the messages about these different vaccines are conveyed to the public. I think the top line message here is that any vaccine that is authorized is going to be a major uh, a benefit to anyone who receives it. So if you have the ability to access one of these vaccines, whichever one of these vaccines it is, 
uh, it is in the best interest to be vaccinated. I would recommend um, my family members, people that I know, if they had access to any of these vaccines, including the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, assuming everything goes well with the FDA review, uh, that they should get that vaccine. And, and, and because of the reasons that we talked about it, it, it prevents the most severe complications of COVID-19. But that said, uh, you know, it can get confusing for the public um, when you have different vaccines that based on different technologies and what seemingly have different efficacies. Uh, and so what we might end up having, and I think this is going to be the topic of discussion quite a bit at FDA and, and CDC, uh, is, you know, perhaps there is something uh, that is in the clinical trial data for the Johnson Johnson vaccine, which shows that it's particularly effective with certain age groups or, uh, you know, there are certain con uh, considerations uh, attached with uh, the Johnson Johnson vaccine that make it uh, amenable to be used in certain um, locations or certain populations. And therefore, the recommendations might come out to direct that vaccine in different ways than you would direct the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. Uh, so uh, I think there is a, a job to be done to both convince people that any of these vaccines is a fantastic tool. Uh, and uh, I, I think everyone should be using that as their top message. Um, but then when you start to get down to it, in order to reduce confusion and to uh, stem any uh, sort of hesitancy that people may have about getting a different vaccine, uh, you know, carefully craft these messages based upon what we know about the science of the vaccines. Uh, and, uh, and then we'll see how they roll out. And, and I think we, we will have to face some challenges. If the vaccine, the Johnson Johnson vaccine is used in certain geographic areas, it's often been um, you know, raise that perhaps it would be used in rural areas where it's harder to get that cold chain um, and you know, the, the freezing capacity for the Pfizer Moderna vaccines. Mm -hmm. uh, and or people who are bedridden might not be able to make a two dose, uh, you know, uh, regimen for the other vaccines. There are certain uh, populations for which it would seem this uh, new vaccine would would be well suited. Uh, but again, you do have that messaging issue. I want to ask you about another debate that's sort of happening across the country. It has to do with who should be next in line to get this vaccine. Um, you know, I've heard people say, well, all, you know, all kinds of frontline workers, people working in grocery stores, they should have access to this vaccine. What about educators? There's this call to reopen the schools, but a lot of educators feel very uneasy about going back into the classroom without a vaccine. What's your take on it? Should teachers be next in line? Yeah, you know, well, this is um, uh, a very important uh, discussion. And even when the first clinical trial data was coming out for Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, we knew that it was going to be a challenge because what we are faced with is a lot of demand uh, for uh, a little supply. And so th our demand for these vaccines outstrips the supply. And so you have to apply some sort of prioritization uh, to who receives the, 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 the limited number of doses that we have. And so uh, early on, it was clearly, um, you know, most people agreed that it was healthcare workers and uh, those who lived in nursing homes, long-term care facilities should be the highest priority and most states have followed those recommendations. But then when you start to uh, go beyond those populations, we see states and, and, and this decision about prioritization does rest primarily at the state level, um, they've taken different routes uh, on prioritization. And some of the populations that you mentioned, uh, essential workers, uh, teachers, uh, you know, our latest look at KFF at the prioritization of different states has shown that, for example, about half of states right now uh, include teachers. Uh, among the priority groups uh, for vaccination. So that means around half of states don't. And uh, that discrepancy, uh, you know, opens up a lot of questions. Uh, and because the federal government can't come in and say, you know, this shall be the group to be vaccinated, I think it raises concerns in people's minds about what is the right uh, prioritization. And uh, right now, that's going to be different across different states. I think these are 
problems that don't have an easy solution. Uh, and there are reasons why different states come down on different uh, ways uh, on prioritization. So there's no simple, straightforward, and uh, right answer here. Uh, but if your priority is to get uh, children back in school and that you want to make sure that teachers feel safe uh, back in an in-class uh, environment, then prioritizing teachers might be a good idea, but then you have to weigh that against all of the other very important uh, priority groups that um, you would uh, perhaps not be emphasizing. So essential workers and those who have a high risk for severe disease, all of whom are very, very uh, important to be vaccinating. And it, it makes for a very challenging situation. And the more vaccines that we have on hand, uh, uh, the more that we can expand our, our vaccination to reach as many groups as possible. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you you sort of map it out very clearly. We're op we're operating in kind of the gray spaces in between, and you know, community. What what's happening in your community may make all the difference. And it, and in many cases, it's not a one size fits all. Though there are some general guidelines that fits all that fit all of us. Wash your hands, wear that mask, social distancing. That's the same across the board. Josh Michaud, thank you. Very nice to speak with you. Thanks. A quick programming note, uh, join us this Thursday for CBSN's hour-long coronavirus special, A Shot of Hope, Vaccine Questions Answered. Dr. Anthony Fauci and other experts will join my colleague Tanya Rivero. That's going to stream Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern right here on CBSN.